dear friends, uh, dear participants, it's not so easy to greet you with joy when you know that yesterday in one single incident in the Mediterranean Sea, several hundred people have drowned, several hundred people being killed in one of the deadly, on one of the deadliest routes of migration. And I consciously say that they are being killed because they are victims of Fortress Europe. So before we start the presentation of border forensic and the Niger, Niger study, uh, I would like to have one minute of uh, silence to the ones who lost their lives yesterday. Thank you very much. And uh, to be honest, uh, I can't stand the, the crocodile tears of Ursula von der Leyen, other U EU politicians, Greek authorities now saying this is such a tragedy because they are all responsible for this disaster. They are following a policy of actively letting people die in the sea because practices of border control, surveillance, and externalization do not prevent these disasters but they promote them. And exactly these practices are done not just in the sea, but already in West Africa, in the Sahel area, especially in the Sahara Desert, which has also become another mass graveyard of people seeking a better life. And our precious, precious partner, Border Forensics, has proven this with a study which is called Mission Accomplished, the Deadly Effect of border control in Niger, which today is presented by almost the whole incredible research team. They are here from all over the world, United States, Switzerland, France, Germany. So I welcome Charles, I welcome Rumur, I welcome Jack, Sam, and Stanislas, because their report shows how routes up north through the desert have changed because of pressure from the European Union, and by that became more dangerous and deadly. My name is Kerem Schamberger. I'm working for Medico International, an international health and human rights organization. And for us, it is very important to make the violence visible to which refugees are exposed on their way. It is important to point out the continuity of violence, which already begins in the countries, countries from, which the, from which the people start to make their way. They are displaced also by the structural violence of our imperial way of life and production, which does not allow so many people to remain. And in order to make visible what refugees experience on their way, to, to, to document it and make it known, to insist on the legitimacy of migration, to support people on their way, this is why we as Medico International are, supported, uh, are supporting the important work of border forensics, because it is about defending the right of freedom of movement. So I welcome you all to this important meeting today. Uh, the timeline will be like that. We will have a short presentation, uh, not a short presentation, but a presentation of about 50 minutes, 50, 55 minutes uh, of all different actors who have done this great report. And then after that, we will have uh, the possibility to, to do a Q&A session where you can all ask all your questions. And with that, I hand over to our dear friend, Charles Heller. Thanks a lot, uh, Karim, for this introduction. And thanks to, to Medico uh, for, for hosting us. Um, despite the, the news that you just mentioned, um, Karim, the you know the the mass killing that you just mentioned. Um, I am nonetheless happy to be here together uh, this evening. Of course, our work starts from uh, border violence, from this reality, from the the urge to document, but also to contest um, border violence in in different ways. Um, Yes, I, I actually, you know, 
wanted to start somehow with, from the same premise as you, uh, Karam, or those who are joining us this evening are are doing so probably on a on a warm summer evening, uh, where wherever you are. Um, hopefully, you're you're all enjoying uh, the summer. But we know that the summer is also a period of uh, struggle and death across the Mediterranean, and we know that in the context that we will address this evening, um, in fact, the combination between restrictive migration policies and border control and extreme heat um, has proven lethal for uh, thousands of people. In fact, the, the actual number of people dying um, across the Sahara and Niger in particular, the focus of our investigation, is to date um, unknown. So what I want to do very, very briefly uh, before handing over to, to the incredible team that is uh, um, assembled here is maybe saying a few words about border forensics, our approach, and how this specific um, investigation uh, emerged. Some of you may know um, that prior to founding border forensics in 2021, um, Lorenzo Pizzani and myself had uh, led the Forensic Oceanography Project based um, within the Forensic Architecture Agency um, in London. And so for some 10 years, we developed new methods to document border violence um, at sea, the, some of the forms of abandonment, precisely, that uh, Karim was mentioning, and that are difficult to register as violence because often these are forms of killing without touching, very far from the forms of direct violence that, um, you know, uh, think of beating or shootings. Um, these are forms of violence in which um, doing and not doing somehow blur, right? And yet are, are no, no less uh, deadly for that. And in 2021, after some 10 years of, of work across the Mediterranean, we felt that, um, Non-governmental actors had developed, despite the continued death, extraordinary capacity to document, but also to intervene at sea. Think, of course, uh, of the Watch the Med alarm phone uh, networks. Think of the many rescue NGOs who, despite their criminalization, tirelessly continue to seek to intervene, to prevent deaths and denounce um, violations and restrictive uh, policies. And we felt that there were many other um, sites of border sites or forms of border control and border violence that um, were not as of yet sufficiently documented and, and contested. And our simple idea was that we could try to adapt the methods of documenting and contesting border violence that we had developed at sea to try and account for other modalities of border violence um, in many different areas, in fact. And we began our work in 2021 by um, focusing on different nodes, if you will, uh, of border control, different rims of border control across migrants' uh, trajectories between Africa and, uh, and Europe. The Mediterranean, of course, remains absolutely uh, essential to our work, and Giovanna Rader here um, who has been acting as coordinator on the Sahara is also, uh, has also been our Mediterranean uh, researcher. We focused on uh, the surveillance of Frontex drones and their role in uh, the pushback machinery to uh, Libya. But beyond the Mediterranean, we also focused on border violence um, disseminated within Europe, in particular, um, the violence that has been witnessed since many years. Um, at the borders between Italy and France. And we supported um, the family of a person who, who died in 2018, Blessing Matthew, um, and the NGOs that supported that family and demands for truth and accountability to try and shed light on the conditions of her death. And finally, we focus on forms of borders, violence that are that operate beyond the Mediterranean, beyond the territory of the EU, such as um, in, um, in Niger. And these are different sites, these are distinct investigations, but somehow what has connected this first series of investigation um, is on the one hand, the, um, our emphasis on border violence operating um, 
across migrants' trajectories and following the trajectories of illegalized migrants from the global south, wherever they go. And on the other hand, the other dimension or element, if you will, that has connected these investigations is um, the emphasis that we put on the way different geophysical environments, the Alps, the sea, the desert, are turned into hostile environments for um, the migrants seeking um, to, to cross them. More specifically, um, concerning our Niger investigation, I mean, we had the plan of uh, investigating border violence in Niger since the start of border forensics in 2021, and somehow this investigation was a, was a long time coming, if you will. We, we privilege uh, at border forensics uh, quality over uh, quantity, and some investigations do take time. And if it took time, it is because uh, we quickly realized that the, the data, and Rumor will say more about this, but the data concerning border deaths in Niger and across the Sahara was extremely scarce and fragmented. And we realized that we needed to forge new methods to try and register the violence of borders uh, across Niger. And so, for example, one important early moment in the, the, the emergence of this, this investigation was a workshop that we held for a whole week with partners from Niger, but also from um, the, the US. And here I'm thinking of uh, Sam Chambers, who will present uh, the methods that he has developed here, and a whole group of researchers and activists from the U working on the U.S.-Mexico borders who have developed extremely fine-grained geospatial methods of analysis for uh, the desertic border area of the Arizona, Arizona uh, desert that we thought maybe we could adapt to the, of course, very different context of, um, of Niger. We also were in dialogue with um, the actors on the ground in Niger who tirelessly and daily seek to document and contest the effects of um, border control in Niger. I'm thinking, of course, of the alarm phone Sahara, the APS, but also of um, the, the IOC and um, other actors. So this investigation took time to emerge. It demanded a lot of experimentation um, from, from the team. And to conclude extremely uh, briefly, it was really enabled by um, an absolutely extraordinary team of researcher that is uh, almost uh, complete, although not quite uh, today. Rumor Ahmed Chiluta, who is completing his PhD in uh, Grenoble, who brought extraordinary field knowledge and analysis to um, the project but also Tara Platt, who precisely is uh, a researcher who herself has focused mostly on the U.S.-Mexico border and who helped steer and coordinate the project and conduct research. Giovanna Rader uh, joined as well in terms of coordination, but also graphic design. Sam Chambers, who I've already mentioned, um, really was extraordinarily inventive in adapting the methods that he had developed with others. Uh, across the US-Mexico borders and adapting them to um, the, the context of Niger. Stanislas Michel also joined in this effort of geospatial uh, analysis and, and innovative methods. Our remote sensing expert, who is not here, unfortunately, uh, this evening, Rosanna P Padaletti, um, used satellite imagery amongst others to register well, shifting tracks that we'll hear more about in a minute. Jack. Uh, ISILs, Giovanna Rader, as I mentioned, uh, produced extraordinary maps, which have uh, a deep politics to them in terms of what they make visible or invisible, something that Jack will mention um, further, further on. There are many other uh, colleagues, partners that supported this project, such as Jel Jelka Kretzmar, um, supporting us in uh, the communication, the advocacy around the project, translators. There, there are too many collaborators, really, that I can um, fully mention. I do also want to mention um, our, our funders, the funders who supported um, this project over uh, this long phase of development. Um, and we're really you know, grateful for, for their support. Of course, Medico uh, was a very precious partner for us. 
uh, but also the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Both these organizations supported specifically this investigation. And of course, our work would not be possible as well without uh, other core funders um, in Germany, for example, uh, the Pro Asil Foundation, but also the, the Robert Bush uh, Foundation. So we're grateful for um, the support of, of all these actors. And the research of Lorenzo Pizzani um, has also been supported by uh, the European Research Council. So with these notes of brief introductory notes and these notes of, of thanks, uh, of course, there, there are many people that I have not been able to thank and that are acknowledged, um, well, in the report's acknowledgments precisely. Um, I'm delighted to hand over to the extraordinary Sahara investigative uh, team and to hear all of you uh, this evening. The floor is yours, uh, Rumor. Rick, can you share the screen, please? <clears throat> uh, next slide, Jacques, please. So, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm uh, Ahmed Chiluta Rumour, um, PhD candidate at uh, Grenoble Alp University and the uh, University of Niamey. I'm also, uh, as Charles mentioned, a researcher at Border for, uh, at Border for So I will begin this presentation, uh, uh, the discussion by presenting the, the policy shift uh, that have transformed Niger's, uh, Niger's border and into an uh, swift, uh, kind of uh, uh, deadly enterprise for for uh, for migrants. So, so as you can see on this map, the uh, uh, the Trans-Saharan migration route, so the, the uh, route migra uh, uh, linking Sub-Saharan Africa to North Africa, particularly in, uh, in Niger, uh, 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 are all red. So this map illustrates the number of migrants who died trying to cross this uh, the, uh, this uh, route. So since uh, uh, 20, uh, 2014, so uh, IOM's uh, missing migrant project has, uh, has recorded at least uh, 2,500 uh, migrant uh, deaths in West Africa, on, of which um, one uh, over 1,100 uh, occurred while crossing the, 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 the Niger part of this uh, of the Sahara. So, so historically, it's, uh, 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 Niger, uh, Niger and particularly the region of uh, Agadez have served as a, a vital crossroad for people connecting uh, as I said, uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to with, with North uh, uh, Af North Africa. So, for about a half uh, a century, so the Nigerian state not only uh, tolerated uh, migration, but occasionally even supported migration toward uh, to Libya or, or Algeria. So, in the, uh, Jack, next slide, please. So, uh, <clears throat> So in the past, uh, 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 Niger will have, for example, we have uh, legalization of migration transport agents, uh, 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 agency, as we, and uh, 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 I think not, uh, uh, not this one, Jack, the, the other one, but uh, maybe. So as, uh, as, we, as we can see on, the, on this, on this, uh, on this cam, uh, on this cam representing the uh, in the shame of the Agadez uh, 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 bus, bus station migrant camp, uh, 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 migration is uh, uh, is uh, relatively uh, while it, it it's been uh, uh, maybe irregular. Uh, uh, Niger, Niger, Niger uh, uh, government uh, uh, is, is not doing anything to uh, to, to stop it, uh, etc. So, uh, and uh, migrant in, uh, migrant can 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 uh, can move uh, uh, free, uh, freely, uh, relatively freely, uh, and safely through Niger passing uh, passing uh, uh, official checkpoint and journey. Uh, in some cases, with military, with military uh, 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 in military converse. So, 
Uh, however, starting from uh, uh, 2013, this uh, as we, uh, this laissez-faire approach began to shift toward a more uh, restrictive and uh, punitive uh, management, uh, migration management policies. So, contrary to what a lot of kind, of, a lot of a lot of research point out, Niger's policy began to sh uh, to shift in, uh, in late 20, uh, 2013. Following the, disc the discovery of, uh, of uh, almost uh, 100 Nigerian migrants, 92 Nigerians, and mostly women, women and children at the Nigerian uh, Algerian border while uh, attempting to reach uh, uh, Algeria. So this this migration is part is part of what we describe as uh, a circular migration and. And uh, also what we, we historize the Niger as a phenomenon can change. So, so uh, after this phenomenon on, on, on November 1st, uh, 13, the, uh, the tragedy was addressed in a communication from the ministry, the Council of, uh, of Minister calling for a fight against the drama of uh, clandestine migration. Uh, and it, uh, uh, this, uh, this council announced some uh, the, the closure of migrant lodge, uh, lodging plus as we, what we call in Agadez ghetto and the the, prose uh, the, prosecution, the prosecution of all actors were who uh, were then characterized as criminal so however this uh, Niger uh, don't have found uh, uh, found uh, uh, to put in act all uh, the, uh, the decision, the, uh, all the uh, decisions. So, uh, until uh, until uh, late 20, uh, 2015, one the, uh, the the narrative uh, prompted by the Nigerian government uh, with, uh, on irregular migration in the aftermath of the the drama of uh, uh, of Kanche. Uh, uh, considered with the one who advocated by, uh, by the UIA engaged in, in the process of externalization, uh, its migration, migration control and the uh, 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 border policy. So, so it's until there uh, that we have seen a, a significant shift in Nigerian migration policy. So this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this narrative. Uh, converged and culminated in, 20, uh, in May 20, uh, 2015 uh, with the adoption of the law uh, 20, uh, 2015 uh, 36 related to uh, illicit migrant trafficking, so which, which, uh, which law criminalized certain services to migrants such as accommodation and uh, uh, transport. So, so <clears throat> In, uh, in, uh, in the same year, in November, so the EU, uh, uh, the the EU's emergency trust fund came into uh, into play. Also, with with Niger being one of the of its uh, largest beneficiary, with it, uh, receiving almost uh, uh, three hundred billion euros. So this fund facilitated the reinforcement of existing border control measures and the creation of new one, like uh, the joint investigation team amid. Um, uh, uh, directly at implementing law 20, uh, 2015, uh, 2015. So the first, the first uh, joint investigation team consisting of uh, Nigerian and French and uh, Spanish uh, police officer was established in Agadez. Uh, and in December, in December 20, uh, 2016, just as the law, uh, the, uh, the law uh, uh, became effective uh, in Agadez in September 2016. So. Uh, and uh, and in in the same years we have we have we seen also the the uh, the, the opening of the uh, ECAPSA head branch in Agadez uh, 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 in April April uh, twenty sixteen so so all this uh, all this new legal and repressive uh, framework resulted in the uh, in hundred arrest of. Uh, 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 and cl uh, closure of uh, of uh, uh, transport agencies and the uh, seizure of uh, transport vehicle. Uh, Jacques, uh, next slide, please. So as you as we can see on on, on these images, so uh, these measures significantly uh, reduces the flow of migrants. So. Uh, and the IOM recorded a step decline in this uh, in migration in migration uh, uh, flow going to Libya from uh, o from over uh, uh, 300, uh, 325,000 between April and September 2016 to just 
37,000 between September and uh, December 2026. 20, uh, so, so this uh, this uh, this figure uh, gave rise to uh, uh, to a mission accomplished narrative among the Nigerian authorities and their international partner. Uh, boasting their success on uh, in, in reducing the number of migrants passing through in Niger and also uh, protect their claim that they're protecting migrants from uh, 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 scrupulous uh, smugglers. So, so, but while the, the uh, uh, Nigerian authority and their international partner uh, are claiming the, uh, the success, numerous, numerous reports from jo journalists, researchers, and activists. Uh, uh, suggest, uh, suggested otherwise, so this uh, uh, arguing that this uh, repress, uh, rep, uh, uh, repressive uh, uh, approach have have not uh, discouraged migrant uh, uh, from passing through Niger, uh, but instead they have simply destabilized uh, the existing transport system, pushing migrant in, in uh, the migrant uh, the migration economy uh, underground and uh, and. And just leading uh, transporter to use more remote and uh, isolated route, increasing the risk, uh, uh, the risk of migrant death and abandonment. Uh, Jack, next slide, please. So as we can see on uh, on, on these images, so <clears throat> this apparatus also uh, increased increased the, the number of interception of migrants of, uh, all over the, the route uh, the road leading to uh, uh, to Libya etc. So now on these images we have uh, uh, the uh, uh, national guard vehicle uh, 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 arresting some uh, migrants in, uh, in the in the desert. So, this stand, this stand is backed. Uh, this uh, this stand, this stand uh, is backed by uh, backed up by uh, data from uh, RWM's missing migrant project. So it's the only uh, the only database that captured uh, this uh, incident, which reports uh, an alarming rise in the number of migrant death, uh, uh, migrant death, migrant. Uh, uh, miss, missing migrants. So for for example, in twenty uh, in twenty fifteen. Uh, uh, we have uh, a missing migrant uh, project uh, recorded only 50, 50, uh, 56 uh, depth of migrant in, in 2015, and uh, this figure rise to uh, uh, over uh, 400 in, in 2017. So uh, uh, it's almost an increase of 700 uh, 700%. So, so uh, uh, not, uh, you should know that this uh, figure is only uh, is uh, only indicative as as the true scale of uh, of uh, migrant death across the Sahara is uh, is uh, is unknown. So, so in the, despite the effort uh, uh, effort of various actors. As uh, 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 Charles uh, pointed out, so, uh, like uh, alarm from Sahara, uh, alternative spatial, and also uh, also uh, uh, IOM uh, uh, rescue uh, risk, rescue mission. So documenting migrant death, because uh, and uh, and systematically compiling them uh, them uh, does not reflect uh, reality. Uh, the, the reality of migrant uh, accurately the reality of migrant life in the Sahara. So, so and the the uh, uh, the severe penalty imposed by the, uh, the this new law adopted by the Nigerian government have forced trans-Saharan migration flow into uh, to move uh, to very re uh, remote area where uh, incident can uh, can easy, can can easily go uh, uh, in a So making the process of collecting data. Uh, collect, collect uh, uh, re reliable data in the, on the number of uh, uh, deaths of, of migrants becomes even more difficult. So it it is. So this uh, this is this is uh, why the, uh, the border forensic investigation sought to, uh, to uh, this is this uh, uh, to feel by developing uh, as Charles pointed out also a, a fine tuned analysis method to uh, to better account. The, uh, the the deadly effect of uh, border control practice in Niger. Next slide, please. 
So our uh, 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 our in, uh, our initial objective uh, 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 mentioned this uh, 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 this investigation was to perform as a, 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 spec, a, a, a spatial analysis of border control trend and the migrant trajectory and to connect them to to the uh, to the danger of crossing. So, uh, 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 however, the analysis of uh, available data, including sources from IOM's uh, 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 migrant I mentioned uh, earlier, and the flow monitoring database, OEM research and rescue uh, data, and, and the report from Alarm from Sahara, Mixed Migration Center, etc. All this, uh, quick, uh, all this data quickly reveal, uh, uh, revealed the, 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 the uh, the, the, the fragmented nature of the uh, 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 of, of the data. So as we can see on this map, so for example, uh, 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 some of the, uh, we can in, in the IOM's uh, uh, database, uh, uh, missing migrant uh, database, we can, we can have a, a depth of migrants uh, located between Agadez and Tripoli. So you can imagine how far it is between Agadez and Tripoli. <clears throat> So uh, in this case, there is no confident uh, geospatial uh, data uh, uh, available to immediately test our hypothesis on the relationship between border practice, the dispersion of migrant trajectory, and uh, the, the uh, ensuing uh, danger. So, so calculating the uh, 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 migrant mortality uh, uh, rate a, a measurement tool used in other contexts like the Mediterranean presented as a, a, a particular challenge as the flow, uh, the flow monitoring data and the missing, uh, missing migrant project uh, lack of uh, accuracy. So, so, <clears throat> so given this data limitation, our approach was uh, inspired and adapted to the Nigerian context from a uh, geospatial analysis method, uh, effectively use it to examine in the, the deadly effect of border control between the United States and the Mexi uh, and Mexico border. So in this sort of desert, Sam will talk more about this uh, later. So we leveraged it. Uh, uh, several data sources and the method cross-referencing uh, uh, cross cross-referencing and uh, uh, combining them. So, so firstly, uh, uh, we, uh, the research relied on qualitative analysis gained over uh, several years of uh, field work in the context of my, as uh, Charles pointed out, my uh, doctoral work at the University of uh, uh, Doctoral Work. So, and secondly, we used a range of spatial analysis method in particular, remote sensing analysis of border infrastructure and shifting track usage to travel uh, uh, across the desert, as well as your statistical modeling to understand the relationship between border control and the change in migrant uh, uh, trajectory. So, so as, as I said in, uh, earlier, in the absence of, of a reliable me uh, measure of migrant mortality, so uh, we, we modeled the variation of Swiss loss depending on the changing speciality of uh, migrant trajectory, which uh, offer an, uh, an indication of the danger facet by migrant traveling in, in and through Niger. So the detail of, uh, of this method will be elaborated in, in FISA by uh, uh, colleagues. So next slide. So and. Uh, and then our uh, methodology, where uh, our met the methodology we, we, we developed, it, uh, we're de uh, we're de uh, deployed on three key sites so along the Dirku uh, Sebha axis or Agra Sebha axis, on the city of uh, the, uh, the, the town of uh, Segidin, uh, the, the uh, Madama military fort, and and the, the Tumu, uh, the Tumu border post at the Niger, uh, Niger, uh, uh, Libya border. So this, these places form an uh, integrated axis, axis of mobility and border control, commonly used by migrant and a wide range of overlapping complex uh, uh, form of mobility. So, <clears throat> so these, uh, using this, this method, we are able to uh, empirically uh, test our, uh, yeah, hypothesis uh, linking the high the high migrant mortality observed since 2015 uh, to uh, to the 
to the control practice implemented in Niger flow uh, following low uh, 2016. 20, uh, so our analysis met the, um, the, the increase the increased danger faced by migrant uh, visible and measure, uh, measurable acidities will be presented by uh, my colleague. Our analysis found a strong correlation existing a causal uh, relationship between the level of invisibility of the track used by migrant and to avoid uh, control and the level of danger encountered along this uh, post-2015 uh, 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 trajectory. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jacques, it's, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rumor, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to speak a little more specifically to some of the sort of political nature of the cartographic and aesthetic decisions we made throughout the production of the report. Um, first and foremost, the shame Rosanna Padaletti is not able to join us today who led the remote sensing effort. And I'm going to start by um, outlining uh, a little bit of that. Uh, as the remote sensing method was really a fundamental kind of investigative technique of the report itself, that being the use of open source and acquired satellite imagery to detect the sort of architectural and geophysical changes brought about by the implementation of this 2016 law. And the two primary kind of um, main sort of focuses of those investigations were centered on uh, a military infrastructure and the developing the development of sort of customs infrastructure, forms of architectures instrumental in the militarization of the desert and the form of further criminalization of migratory dynamics in the region and also migratory dynamics themselves locations of migratory tracks uh, deviating from main infrastructural arteries into the deserts the former of which we were very happy to render visible or uh, make public and publish in the report um, you're seeing some of those images now focusing on the military buildup at Segedin in 2011, 2017, and 2022. However, when it came to the documentation, detection, and subsequent representation of um, migratory tracks in the desert and migratory dynamics, this was a much more um, problematized uh, task, let's say. We did not want to contribute to the further criminalization of uh, said migratory tracks by publishing their exact location within the report and nor do we want to contribute to the sort of um, reductive aesthetic languages that are put forward by images like you see here in the context of um, frontex reports these are images lifted from uh, previous frontex reports and so our primary concern was developing a sort of aesthetic methodology that will enable us to publish the sort of um, empirical precise results that were derived from our detection of migratory tracks in the desert and their connection to militarization in the region yet in a way that would not support the further criminalization of these activities or further endanger these infrastructures through military policing the methodologies we developed um, which i'm going to go now into a little bit more detail surrounded the remote sensing or the initial remote sensing of these tracks which you sort of see slightly visible here within this satellite image and these tracks are made visible by the displacement of sand and um, by vehicles traveling along them with vehicles of increased traffic and um, increasingly visible as the sand is further displaced so for our internal investigations we classified these tracks in a fairly rigorous process developed by Rosanna classifying tracks from um, increasingly traveled to, to less increasingly uh, traveled, as you can see here. We subsequently placed dots at defined intervals along these tracks, and those the definition of those intervals was mainly derived by the resolution of the drawing in order to methodologically ensure that whatever scale at which we were presenting these tracks at we would adhere to a given level of diffusion and a sort of given level of um, set level of anonymity, let's say, within the track's representation. These points allowed us to develop 
uh, heat maps, which formed a crucial sort of critical dimension of uh, the aesthetics of the report and one heat maps that spoke to not nor precise locations of tracks themselves, yet overall accumulative densities, a way to sort of empirically show uh, temporal changes in the movement of tracks without having to allude to their precise location. And this was really evident in the work we did surrounding the case studies in which we clearly showed correlations between the development of military infrastructure like that which you see here at Madama and the sort of dispersion of tracks and migratory dynamics increasingly further into the desert. And this was really, this worked, you know, in very much in coalition with some of the material that Sam is going to go into more detail into next in the terms of defining uh, the increase of track distribution to dangerous areas across the desert away from main roads in which return to the road would be a sort of biologically impossible for lack of a better term and we define that definition of danger in relation to some sweat loss modeling that as I said Sam will, will go into in further detail but this was really a, a technique um, aesthetically that also sought to sort of found a kind of infrastructure building project in the report itself in that we really sought to foster an aesthetic technique that would also garner trust and further relations with the brave individuals uh, that sought to contribute witness testimonies to the report and sought to ground truth the um, remote sensed realities that we were kind of detecting from afar. And this uh, sort of um, the dimension of the heat map also found a home in various other forms of representation on the project within this context, um, showing a sort of a diffuse red heat map indicative of migrant deaths as reported by IOM between 2014 and 2021. This sort of diffusion or imprecision spoke to the very practitious, imprecise nature of the data sets themselves, the sort of practitious, imprecise dimension that actually seeks to um, foster forms of, well, non accountability, non accountability of governmental organizations um, responsible for these deaths themselves. So, in that sense, you know, kind of in conclusion, I'll say that it did. Um, the aesthetic decisions specifically in the context of the heat map that we made throughout the report sought to not only move away from the reductive aesthetic languages that are so common to government sponsored reports on migratory dynamics in the region, but also sought to ensure the safety security of the migrant infrastructures and communities that we sought to document um, within the report's development. So with that, I think I'll pass to Sam, who's going to talk a little bit more detail into the sweat loss modeling. Thank you. Um, yes. So uh, my part of this, a uh, bit of it had to do with two things. Uh, viewshed modeling and sweat loss modeling and the uh, basics of viewshed modeling it's like in uh, a line of sight measurement so we took the roads the main roads and the tracks and mapped out what locations on the landscape in these areas were visible from the main road and measured how much of these tracks were visible and assigned them values based on how visible or invisible a location and a track was. And that's done through a uh, geospatial analysis with a digital elevation model. So uh, imagine a, a 2D and some mathematics, basically 
representing a 3D model of if someone's standing in this location and looking in a in each direction possible, what can they see across the landscape? And the map on the left there is just a binary of the um, a viewshed model. And you'll notice these dense spots of white, which uh, there's like a linear feature, a main road, and then there's a plateau and uh, the bottom right there that's definitely visible from most locations on the road. And uh, as tracks moved away from the road and behind dunes and other landscape features, they become less visible, like those black areas that have some sort of feature obstructing the view. And then the sweat loss model is a geographic representation of uh, years of research uh, that people have put into of estimating the human heat balance and cooling effects, how much water a person must perspire to, to cool themselves in such conditions. And that's a function of the metabolic heat they're producing just from walking. Um, we accounted for like the sorts of surface people are walking on in this landscape. The atmospheric factors, the ambient temperature, the radiant heat off the landscape onto a person's body, and the um, the wind and uh, even the humidity, and made a cost distance model. So if somebody is stranded on one of these tracks, how much supplemental water is it going to take them? How much sweat are they going to lose to reach the main road if stranded? Um, and next slide. So we did this for multiple, all the, the, the study areas, the locations. And there was a, a general pattern of uh, across all of them, but more pronounced in other areas of places becoming the tracks being less visible to the main road. So people taking routes that if you're driving on this, you're less likely to be detected. And also, if you're stranded on these tracks, it's going to take much more effort and exposure and water loss to find yourself to relative safety. And this map just represents, you see, the main road, the view shed in the blue, and then these radiating almost like topographic lines, and that those uh, represent the uh, increments of liters of water lost. And people, basically, uh, you're going to need two liters of water to to make it to the road, but also once you've lost about 0.67 liters of water, your cognition and cognitive function decreases and you're much more likely to become lost. So these effects are going to greatly impact um, your, your chance of survival if uh, stranded. Next slide. And yes, here's an example of those those densities of the tracks as compared to those lines of the uh, the water lost. So you'll see these very dense areas, more tracks on the outer peripheries where uh, people are have a very small chance of survival if stranded. And next slide. Sorry, was that two? Okay, so yeah, and there's a, a shift here basically of like becoming um, more of these dense areas well outside of the the limit of two liters. So not only is their cognitive function likely 
to fail drastically, even if they are able to navigate to the main road, they're they're going to need extra water to actually make that alive. Okay, next slide. So, um, I, I the, guess this this was a this this yeah, was this my is, slide, uh, Sam. Yeah. Or? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sam, for all the explanations. Thank you. Um, as as for for my part, I'm going to address the causality demonstration between um, the implement the implementation of the law that uh, Rumo talked about, and and the danger to which migrants are exposed. So basically, on on the one hand, Jack showed that there is an increased military activity that occurred over time, that is basically geared toward more border control. Uh, and on the other hand, he exposed with, with maps the splintering of tracks that were used by migrants. And over time, uh, these tracks were going further away from the main road uh, and border control points in more dangerous areas. So basically, our analysis was designed to understand the extent uh, to which the implementation of this law was somehow responsible for the splintering of tracks and the increased danger to which migrants are exposed. So first, as Sam said, we addressed the, the, the question of the invisibility of tracks. Um, interviews with drivers in the desert uh, indicates that routes are chosen based on avoiding uh, border control. Uh, they use alternative tracks that are less visible from the main road uh, to avoid border control. So we tried to quantify this. And to do so, uh, Sam developed the visibility index, which is based on, on the view shell analysis. So to, to resume this briefly, every pixel on, on, in space gets a score that equals to uh, the number of points from which the pixel is visible from the main road. So basically, the greater the value the pixel has, the more visible uh, the pixel uh, is from the main road on which border controls uh, patrol. And when we looked at the intersection of the tracks that we identified with remote sensing with the view shed analysis score, uh, what came out is that for most sites, uh, the visibility of tracks significantly decreased after the law passed. So not only the tracks splintered further away from the main road and border control points, uh, they also went towards less visible paths. And we also use a notocorrelation analysis, which is very similar, but it assesses the, uh, the pattern of invisibility in the surrounding of the, of the tracks that, that, we, uh, that we identified. And we we could see clusters of points around the tracks that have also a low visibility score. So this analysis shows that after the law, the number of low visibility clusters increased. And this is what could be seen on the graph right now. Um, it means that basically over time, the tracks shifted towards less visible places in a very systematic way. Not only the tracks themselves were less visible, but the surroundings were less visible too. So basically this first section gives some explanation on, on why the track splinter. Uh, people are going towards less visible areas because they're avoiding border control. And on the next slide, it's, um, it explains the, the second step of our analysis. So basically, um, we dived into the relationship between the invisibility and the danger that uh, migrants are exposed to. So the question that we ask is, is the following. Uh, is there an increased danger encountered by migrants using these invisible tracks? So basically, we looked at the intersection between uh, visibility pixels and the sweat loss model. And we could assess that um, less visible places are correlated with greater danger related to, uh, to sweat loss. So this is what this figure shows on, on the right side. Um, you can see a trend of increasing danger as the visibility decreases. So overall, when we look at the two groups of tracks that we have, so basically the one before the law and the one after the law, uh, the latter is, is way more dangerous because of invisibility tactics used by, by migrants to avoid border, border control. So all in all, this, this was a really a two-step process. First, we showed that the splintering tracks are related to visibility. Um, so after the law passed, alternative tracks were used uh, that were used are less visible and farther away from the main road. And, and then we assessed that lower visibility is associated with greater danger. So the less visible the tracks are to detection, the more passengers uh, using these tracks are at risk of, of dying. So these results, these yeah, statistical results combined with empirical evidences provided by, by Rumor, 
uh, suggest that there is a, a causal relationship between the implementation uh, of the law and the danger faced by, uh, by, by migrants. And contrary to what official statements um, would have us believe, the splintering of tracks and, and deaths in the desert are definitely not the result of a, of a random process. Um, I guess the, the floor is yours, uh, Charles, if you want to, to conclude. Thanks so much to um, to all of you. It's really amazing to to listen to the whole team and to you know get a, a glimpse, uh, hopefully for for the public as well, joining us uh, here into uh, the the wealth, the diversity um, of the methods, the approaches that have been um, uh, experimented with and developed by our team to try to account for the lethal effects of border control. Um, in in Niger, um, there are maybe two elements from that that I'd like to uh, highlight um, from the interventions of um, my my colleagues here, um, and both those elements concern, um, let's say, the the politics of knowledge that we try to operate um, in this investigation, and well, simply embarking on this investigation, we faced. Um, a number of challenges. Um, I would say that the first set of challenges um, really concerns the attempt to develop a non-Eurocentric um, approach to migration across parts of the African continent and somehow a non-Eurocentric approach to um, the effects of border external European border externalization um, itself, right? Um, in fact, contrary to what we are often led to believe, uh, the people moving across uh, the, the the area that we focused on are certainly not all heading uh, towards Libya and subsequently towards uh, attempting to cross the Mediterranean towards Europe. There's a wide range of diverse mobilities intersecting in this space um, with many, for example, people from Niger, but also other West African countries coming, say, to work in uh, the gold mines in this area uh, over the last year. So how do we analyze the effects of border control on um, uh, illegalized migrants um, without reducing all movements across this space to um, Africa to Europe uh, migration. This was one uh, challenge we faced, and we sought throughout the report to really uh, foreground the diversity and the multidirectionality of mobility uh, across this, this space. And the other is precisely this, this idea that uh, Rumor has already um, emphasized. Even though we are critical of European policies of border externalization, um, the research of Rumor really um, emphasizes the role of Niger as an actor with a, an, an agenda in, um, in its own uh, right. And somehow um, the law, the 2015 law itself and the, 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 the implementation of this law with new forms of border control is really uh, the convergence, if you will, of those different actors and interests. And for us, it was really important also to keep, um, yeah, really... Uh, foreground as well, the role and responsibility um, of, of Niger and not only um, of, of Europe, even though that responsibility is, is very important. And then I'd like to foreground as well um, the politics of knowledge in relation to what um, Jack emphasized as well. In fact, really for every single one uh, of the investigation that we uh, engage with, we always have a, an important question as a starting point. What are states revealing and what are they concealing? And how can we seek to reverse that partition of the sensible uh, in, in Ranciere's terms? Um, I.e., how can we make visible what states are trying to conceal? In this case, the military presence and the effects of border control. But how can we keep in the shadows, conceal um, the, what they 
states are trying to reveal, and in this case, the very precise trajectories of illegalized migrants, um, the knowledge of which would serve to um, con control them. So yeah, I just wanted to foreground these strands and, and this kind of attempt to position our investigation in relation to the politics of knowledge um, in relation to elements that uh, the team has already um, foregrounded. I mean, from our analysis of the effect, the lethal effects of border control um, in Niger, of course, there are um, a number of, you know, key demands and conclusions that uh, emerge really from, from our analysis. Clearly, um, all actors, whether from Niger, from Europe, or UN agencies and others involved in the drafting and implementation of the 2015 law should be held to account for the increased deaths and suffering of migrants that this law and its implementation has caused. The government of Niger should immediately end the criminalization of the many actors who transport and interact with migrants. The European Union, its agencies, its member states should immediately acknowledge their role in supporting and perpetuating harmful migration policies in Niger and beyond and bring an end to all policies and programs contributing to externalizing border control. And of course, um, what we need fundamentally is a fundamental reorientation of migration policies in Europe and beyond. A reorientation of migration policies to create legal frameworks allowing for the reality of international mobility, um, including that of African citizens to unfold in a safe legal way, rather than pursuing the illusion of stopping migration at an enormous um, human cost. Of course, we're aware that such a, a policy shift, which alone would be able to bring an end to the deaths across Niger, but also coming back now uh, to the Mediterranean and uh, in other areas, is um, very far from being on uh, the policy agenda of the EU in particular. We've just seen this with um, the, the agreements that are um, coming together concerning uh, what we call Europe's pact against migration and uh, migrants and, and refugees. And what this means then is that, um, well, the work of different actors on the ground, again, such as Alarm Phone, such as um, uh, Alternative Espace Citoyen and others will continue to be um, absolutely uh, essential, as will, unfortunately, uh, the work of developing new methods to document the effects of uh, restrictive migration policies and, and border violence. Um, in particular, it seems essential to continue developing methods that might um, allow to document also more precisely specific incidents of border deaths um, in Niger and elsewhere across the Sahara. Uh, as, you, as you've seen, our investigation uh, remained rather at a, at a broader spatial uh, scale, if you will, um, in terms of offering a geospatial and geostatistical analysis of the effects um, of border control. But we need also to be able to document specific incidents of border deaths um, to determine the, the actors whose actions and inactions have participated in uh, leading to those deaths to identify the deceased and uh, reestablish contact with their, their families. And of course, there is also um, another absolutely crucial uh, trend over several years now that we um, do not really address in this investigation, which is uh, the, the structural pushbacks from Algeria to um, uh, Niger with dozens of thousands each year of people who are pushed back into the no man's land um, at the, the Algerian-Niger border. And this also leads not only to injustice and violence, but also to, to, to deaths. Um, and this also is absolutely essential to, uh, to address. So on, on this note, I think I would uh, close our own introduction of this report and um, associated methods, uh, unless uh, any one of my uh, the, the wonderful Sahara investigative team uh, would like to add 
uh, anything here. We, we still have time for questions and to expand on certain points um, um, in, the, in the rest of the evening. Thank you very much uh, to the whole team of Border Forensics. I mean, I'm really amazed of the work you have done there. And I'm also a bit overwhelmed because uh, I mean, the, the, the work you've, you've been doing, I myself, I'm, I'm also coming from social sciences, but I was never very good in statistics. So I'm <laughs> more from a qualitative side of research. But yeah, it's uh, unbelievable, and thank you for presenting it uh, with that, uh, yeah, with that much knowledge. So, are there any questions uh, from the participants of this event? Just raise your hand, and uh, then we will unmute you. Our technical support, Andrea, will give you the floor. There is a remark by Mike Dirksen in the chat, but that's not a question. So are there any questions? Everybody's overwhelmed. <laughs> So maybe I can start with a question uh, or with a remark or yeah, but maybe both at the same time. Uh, you were talking about the politics of knowledge. It's a term I really liked a lot. And uh, when we have a look at the recent discussions on the EU pact against migration, uh, we, we saw that the, these discussions are based on uh, lies based on not knowing anything, based of a lack of knowledge uh, by the EU politicians, uh, European Union officials, by the German Minister of Interior, Nancy Faeser. Uh, they were all like talking on the base of not knowing anything, and or I would even call it sometimes lying. So now this is the one side. And now you as border forensics, you have produced uh, such a huge report with such great knowledge, with such evidence uh, and new uh, methods so uh, is this i mean is this a way to 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 fight this lack of knowledge or is it uh, like who who uh, who can understand this except people like us people uh, who are uh, fighting for the freedom of movement like will it be recognized by politicians who base their politics on the lack of knowledge Maybe it's a bit a, a bit complicated question, but yeah, sorry. Maybe I can start by thinking with that question, and of course, if anybody else in the team would, would like to go ahead, uh, please please uh, do. I mean, um, uh, you know, Karam, I I think, you know, we don't have any illusions. I think in terms of enlightening uh, EU policymakers, simply because you know there is a clearly uh, a strategic uh, ignorance of a vast body of research, um, you know, uh, established since years by migration border scholars. Uh, there's really a strategic and clearly intentional ignorance of, you know, our empirical findings since since uh, since many years. Um, and so you might think, you know, okay, but so then what is this worth? What 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 actual politics will this report uh, do? Well, you know, I think part of this, in a sense, is is also not fully predictable. Uh, a report has its own migration; it has its own trajectory. Uh, it will be seized upon by actors that we don't fully uh, know of yet. But I, I do think um, that this report will, for example, have maybe a different effect than other investigations that were, for example, directly linked to litigation, say. But I don't think it's less important. I just think, you know, back, for example, to our uh, death by rescue report or uh, blaming the rescuers report, in which we, you know, really provided a fact-based analysis um, of the claims 
put forth against the pull factor argument, uh, you know, pull, put, put forward in relation initially to Mare Nostrum, the Italian uh, military and humanitarian operation, and then later against NGOs. Well, it, it gave um, a range of actors, including rescue NGOs, um, weapons in their arguments with many different actors. And that in itself is, um, I think, extremely important. And I really hope that many different uh, non-governmental actors will seize upon um, our report, our findings, and be able to say, no, this is not true. Uh, we can demonstrate this. We can demonstrate the lethal effects of your, uh, of your policies. And my other hope is really, and maybe, you know, they're coming back to the, to the conclusions uh, that, I, that I was already drawing, um, is that we start to demonstrate that different tools, different methodologies, a kind of broad repertoire of possibilities to actually document border violence in Niger, in the Sahara, that it exists. Uh, we didn't, you know, we've, we've highlighted very much the way that we, we did not fully invent it. Uh, our colleagues um, working uh, along the US-Mexico border did a tremendous amount to invent these methods that were partly adapted, expanded um, to the context of Niger, but so much more needs to be done. And hopefully uh, the report somehow paves the way to uh, this broad repertoire of methods that needs to be developed to document more precisely the effects of lethal effects of border control, but also very precise incidents. That is, um, it's, a, it's a modest hope in a sense for the effects uh, of the report, but um, um, I believe already, already important. That, but I would love to hear also maybe Rumour also, you know, what you think uh, the effects of the of the knowledge base that we produce here might have, for example, in in Niger, you know, what 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 effects it might have. Yeah, I don't think I, don't, uh, I have anything else to add on what you said uh, already. But I, I want just to insist on the fact that uh, when we discuss with uh, with. Uh, people from security forces etc uh, most of them as uh, um, at the, uh, 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 even at uh, at, um, uh, at the high level of the, uh, of the uh, security forces uh, 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 architecture they are aware of, of all of the, uh, for all of what we are we're, we're talking about in, in the uh, in the report so in in, in some cases we have we have some so, uh, some of them so, uh, after the publication of the of the report i, I received some uh, some uh, message uh, message and call from uh people from security forces and also some uh, politician in, uh, in niger they are uh must have from uh, uh, uh notably from the agadis uh, uh, regional council etc the, the um uh, some of them uh, looks like they're discovering all of these things that are, are happening in the desert but most uh, in the past they're talking uh, when uh, they're talking about uh, uh, all of this uh, you see you see uh, uh, they're voicing on this issue but they don't they don't really uh, uh, understand uh, uh, how all of this is uh, uh, the, uh, the mechanism through which all uh, all of this is, mm -hmm. is happening etc mm -hmm. so uh, in, in 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 some way, uh, uh, it looks like they're 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 welcoming uh, this work, etc. So maybe it will be uh, hopefully, hopefully, but uh, so uh, we managed to uh, 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 they, they can use this work to uh, to uh, 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 to ameliorate the, the uh, uh, migration policy, etc. But Hopefully not in, 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 uh, in the bad way. So I think we, in the report we managed to do. Uh, uh, we took the uh, pro uh, uh, some precaution uh, uh, as uh, uh, Jack uh, explained it out. Not 
all of this uh, knowledge uh, to be uh, uh, used in, in a bad way, so a misuse of, uh, of our, uh, our, so it's, I think it's the only thing I have to say about this. Thank you. I mean, this is very interesting what you said, because maybe this, I know that in Niger, there are huge discussions about this law 036, which was introduced now eight years ago. And I also was informed that there was an, a, a workshop last year done by the Ministry of Justice with civil society actors to discuss about the reform uh, of this law so that some things might be ab abandoned or changed inside the law. And this uh, report maybe could also help to convince somehow, uh, uh, not, maybe not to convince, but to, as, as Charles said, to give a weapons uh, to give a weapon uh, in the hand of civil society actors to 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 challenge the government and say, okay, now this these are the effects, so uh, you don't have any excuse to change the law. Of course, we know that there are very powerful interests on the other side, European uh, Union with a lot of money in their hands. But yeah, I mean, this uh, also I, th I think this report is also worth a lot of money because uh, or worth a lot because it's it's uh, has such a strong argument. Just, uh, yeah, just to add uh, maybe an uh, anecdotal discussion I have with people from Conseil Regional after the after uh, linking to the to uh, to the, uh, the workshop the, uh, uh, we were talking about on uh, uh, and the, uh, the needed revision of the law etc. So the the, uh, the Agadez Regional Council is very implicated in this, but when uh, uh, with the uh, with the report, so most uh, some of them are telling me that maybe they can use the the report to to uh, to uh, as we said to to uh, to, uh, to influence the uh, 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 the, the law uh, revision. But initially, the 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 paradox is that uh, uh, in the past the uh, the regional uh, council is used as uh, is trying to. Uh, uh, to change the law, not uh, uh, the, the, the question of the mortality of migrants is not the, the main object of the Council mm -hmm. of the uh, Agadez Regional Council because they are aware of this. But what the, what they are concerned with is the, uh, is the uh, uh, social and politi uh, uh, political impact of the law. So now. The, the the want to use the the, the question of the mortality of migrant etc to maybe to to push on, uh, the, uh, uh, some uh, in the revision of the laws are there any questions from the audience i mean this is the one and only ch chance to talk to the almost the whole team of the border forensic crew who did this report so uh, take your chance and uh, ask questions. I mean, I have a lot of questions, but I don't want to be the only one talking. So uh, I don't see any hands raised. Maybe uh, a question to the, the to the rest of the crew. Uh, I think Sam and Jack, you are based in the US both. Uh, I don't know if I, no, Jack is not based, but Sam at least. I mean, uh, have you been, I mean, have you all been to, to Niger? I don't think so that the whole team was there, but how was it to work in such an international team, I think Rumor he's the ex he's the expert. He he comes from Niger and he knows everything there. But how was it to collaborate uh, with such an international team on such a specific uh, uh, topic? Is that so? Um, well, uh, yeah. Uh, before this, most of the like collaboration internationally just was like just across the border here uh in mexico and uh speaking and working with people um in sonora and it's very like specific topic of interest you know to people right here and it uh, it was I was glad to like offer what I had learned from that to this team to apply it internationally. And it also uh, allowed me to one, 
um, fine tune these models and improve upon them. And uh, two, also this shows some very um, different, you know, there's the general pattern of like this border externalization and enforcement intensifies these effects of uh, what would be considered, you know, death by exposure, natural causes, but they're not. Uh, but there's some distinct differences between what happens here, like in Southern Arizona, compared to North Africa. Um, and the, the types of enforcement and the effects, like right now, and where I'm at, there's so much like tech and industry in the US put into this and infrastructure that the uh, the paths are basically known. It's like compacted people and into these specific, almost specific routes that may shift with the years. Unless, you know, it started out in dispersal, but now it's like control of here you are and you got to take this strenuous journey. And uh, it's not exactly the, the same thing in the case of just like a, like, uh, like a web of tracks trying to avoid. There's, it's, um, it was uh, sad, and, but interesting to see that, that contrast. Um, it's very harsh conditions on, on both people crossing these different borders, but um, very different experiences, especially, you know, regarding uh, vehicles, not just, you know, starting out walking from a point, reaching another point. There's a, a level of uncertainty that's not the same here in U.S. and Mexico. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there somebody else from the coup? There would be also a question, but is there anybody else who wants to add on that? Um, I mean, just add a little bit in a different dimension to what Sam said. I think um, definitely the sort of remote and first and foremost, the remote nature, I think, of the team's composition also lent itself to some of the developing some of the sensibilities that we deployed in the kind of you know, graphic political decision that's made through the reports development. I think obviously there's an inherent nature that we did not want to replicate other phenomenon of, of, of remote work, let's say, in which organizations remote to the location are contributing to sort of uh, uh, certain conversations that are not uh, inherently engaged with community organizations. And I think, you know, just to sort of echo that, um, some of the decisions that I explained earlier in the presentation surrounding aesthetics, you know, that was, I think, in some ways, a sort of response or at least a sensitivity to the geographical composition of the team and the, the sort of interface that uh, engenders, let's say, with both the subject matter and the, and the communities on the ground. Thank you very much. Um, yes, now we have a question from David Dambio. Uh, I know him very well because he is one of the most active members of refugees in Libya. And I'm very happy that you listened to the presentation. And I'm very curious about your question. So please, David, uh, maybe you can have a talk now or have a speak. Uh, hello, uh, good evening. It's been uh, you know wonderful to have this session with you to follow up you know uh, uh, thoroughly because when the report came out uh, most of us were not able to read all the long pages but uh, illustrating it uh, so easily like this on a human level that uh, we are able to understand exactly how the work has been done and uh, how it is evolving this is great for me, and I'm coming to speak from different dimensions. I think at least three dimensions. The dimension of uh, someone who had uh, lived this experience, traveled through the Sahel and worked even at the, at the mining site, which I saw here in the diagram and so on. And uh, the other side of me could uh, you know, uh, see the things 
from uh, activist uh, perspective. Why is this so useful? And uh, the other part of it is, uh, you know, uh, how excited it is, of course, the death of people cannot make someone excited, but when you see a very dedicated and committed group of people who are trying to use different mechanism to, you know, to illustrate what the government is trying to, to bury, as you could see, you know, uh, steps and uh, uh, the tracks of people disappearing into the desert because they have been forced to keep to from different, uh, from the original route to routes where they could hide from the police or border control forces. This is what I wanted to touch and uh, I would uh, so much want to thank uh, Rahul and uh, I think uh, strongly I will party with what Charles Heller said regarding the effect and the impact of this report. Of course, now as uh, Ra uh, uh, Ramul was saying that in Niger, the military architecture team are knows what they are doing and they know the value of course, the politicians are not as stupid. They are just, you know, playing ignorant to the situation. And uh, of course, when we talk about industrialization and uh, the use of technology and these online spaces, it's uh, proving to become more uh, crucial and uh, fundamentally needed for now and uh, the people that will come tomorrow because we, we will so much depend on technology in the next, uh, from the next 10 years to going on. And uh, coming to the European level, I think uh, they are already well equipped, e equipped uh, based on the you know political knowledge of using architecture, of using this uh, technology to demonstrate. Because when you look at the use of Frontex, for example, on the Mediterranean, how they are able to detect even you know boats before they arrive, how they are even to, to you know having the gut to say that this boat is not in distress because they are able to inspect it using their own technology. So. The, the significantly knows this, but uh, we are hoping that with the production of this work, with the team being committed to bring change and to fight and to push for accountability tomorrow, someone in, in the government, in the migration pact, uh, however it is being drafted, I cannot mention German, it's terrible. This, uh, you know, someone mentioned uh, Nancy Faisal uh, and Alina Baerbock, which I met a few weeks ago, Things seemed to, you know, to be very transparent about the deadly migratory route and the policies that are pushing people to take this journey. But in the end, what they use, they came up with these gears and the new migration pact, which is not only overseeing the Mediterranean, but uh, EU border externalization to Libya, the Sahel, including Niger, and then. Uh, the mass uh, ex explosion, uh, explosion of uh, people from Algeria, which Stella was saying, these are the things that we have been following with close attention, but uh, it's just like a, a number of things which you cannot work on at the same time, but I'm glad to see that uh, this report has come out on Niger and uh, I would recommend that it goes on to Morocco, to Tunisia, to Libya as well, to, you know, to, address these issues using different methods because when we talk about uh, politics we are limited as victims when we try to push for for changes or for accountability we are limited the moment we see these possibilities of uh, using technology it gives me hope to even speak to even go and demonstrate and say no we want change we want this kind of recognition so it was more or less not a question but a kind of uh, comment and compliment for the people uh, also who are invisible in this report for the local people because reading the report I realized that uh, without without the uh, contribution and commitment of the local people this wouldn't have been able to even you know estimate the number uh, when it comes to sweat uh, the sweat loss I don't know this uh, terminology that you're using excuse my little knowledge on, on, on this so I would end here, but uh, I, I really uh, encourage you to continue doing this work. And uh, we as the refugees, uh, refugees in Libya or the people on the move in, uh, in Libya, in Tunisia, in, uh, in the Sahel, I think uh, if our contribution is needed anytime, we will be standing by to render our, our support. Thank you. Thank you very much.
uh, David, uh, and to the rest of the audience, I mean, I, I suggest you to, to follow Refugees in Libya and their work because it's really amazing what they are doing under very harsh and complicated uh, conditions. Uh, so Charles, I think uh, the floor is yours now and then uh, I will, we can slowly close the event. Charles. Thank you so much. Well, look, I, I simply wanted to very briefly uh, respond as well to um, David Yambio's uh, intervention. Uh, David uh, is clearly one of the most inspiring uh, activists uh, out there uh, today. And David, I appreciate your uh, you know your your support and your acknowledgments um, of uh, of our report, and at the same time, I'm thinking back to um, the demonstration in front uh, of the UNHCR in in the cold um, last uh, last December. Um, a demonstration that you and others uh, led from Tripoli to Geneva uh, in in front of the UNHCR to to denounce their lack of support and defense um, of refugees in Libya. And I was really struck by the fact that, well, in fact, we have piles of reports concerning uh, the horrendous uh, treatment of migrants and refugees in Libya. And yet precisely, again, uh, that uh, empirical evidence, uh, the assessments of UN agencies uh, that are, are denouncing what is happening in Libya as probable crimes against humanity, a term that should make us uh, tremble, uh, let alone the testimonies of uh, many, many migrants and refugees who have crossed Libya. That is simply not having uh, the effect of leading to the end of those policies. And so somehow, uh, for me, one of the elements that was so powerful in uh, the demonstration that you and others led um, in Geneva was somehow uh, coming in front of the UNHCR and saying, look, you have refused to hear us. Now, when we come beneath your windows, in front of your doors, can you hear us now? And I know that there is a very important demonstration being organized uh, in the coming weeks in, in Brussels. Um, where David and others will bring the voices of refugees in Libya and many other contexts um, in front of the windows, the doors, the offices of all of these policymakers who refuse to know, who refuse to hear, who refuse to see. So somehow I, I, I appreciate your support uh, for, for our work, David. And of course, we, we continue to do it because we, we do think it can have an effect. And at the same time, for me, David, you're initiative exemplifies the moments we need where we need to go beyond reports when we need to take to the streets and uh, bring our voices in front of all of those who refuse to know, who refuse to see, who refuse to hear. There was a last question from Sophia Eagle. Uh, and I mean, sorry, very sorry for that, that only men were speaking today. So I'm Happy also that Sophia will, will take the floor now, Sophia. Hey, thank you so much for uh, your incredible work and the sharing of uh, all these um, methods. And um, yeah, while listening to you, um, I'm very interested in how to 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 get to know the methods more. And I was asking, I was questioning if probably there is sometimes something like a border forensic school or a forensic architecture school where everyone can attend to and whoever wants. <laughs> so to spread the knowledge also. Um, and also I would like to ask you, um, like you are currently here and also maybe the other team members on where, it, where your work will continue and also where it reaches out to people who are listening here or to other formats like exhibitions or whatever is possible. Thank you. I can try and respond very, very briefly. And, and of course, again, others should, uh, should join. I mean, um, there is a fabulous uh, program in um, uh, critical forensic practice based um, 
at Goldsmiths, uh, closely connected to forensic uh, architecture. So that is a, a fabulous place to uh, learn about these uh, these methods. There are others, of course. I my, myself teach uh, several courses on border forensics in, in different universities, That some of which can also be uh, possibly uh, attended um, re remotely. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy to uh, to be in touch and, and share uh, more more insights on these pedagogical uh, initiatives, some of which I, I teach as well with uh, my my colleagues um, here. Um, in terms of next steps um, for for border forensics, I mean, of course, again, our our idea is not to lead one investigation in a particular area and then stop. Rather, our idea is. Uh, to try and lead a series of investigations, collaborate with actors on the ground, and build uh, capacities together uh, that may, you know, strengthen the capacity of non-governmental actors to document border violence, hold actors uh, accountable, and hopefully, in turn, be able to actually intervene to uh, prevent um, acts of, of border violence. So investigations in the Alps, uh, across the Mediterranean, in uh, Niger and the Sahara will uh, certainly continue in um, in different forms. There are also another series of investigations that are uh, emerging as well. And some, while several of our investigations that I mentioned today, uh, it, we often emphasize the, the we tried to 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 register and make visible forms of indirect violence again that operate through a kind of weaponization of uh, the environment. Of course, we're seeing, seeing another very disturbing trend across European borders, in particular uh, the external rim uh, around uh, European territory of all too direct and brutal violence. And yet, uh, despite videos of, say, Croatian border guards beating uh, migrants as they cross, despite these elements that are important to, to document, um, these violations, this violence is continuing. So the demands possibly new uh, methods that go beyond revealing these acts of individual violence to somehow account for um, the, the system that's enabling the perpetuation um, of, of that violence. It's difficult to say a lot more uh, specific also for ongoing investigations that are you know, sensitive um, and that we, we, we will have to reveal when they are uh, actually published to, in, to enable the work that is uh, ongoing, but yeah, that is one direction in which we are um, currently uh, working. One of the front lines uh, in which we are we are working, and uh, again, as I mentioned, our our investigations once they are published, once they are made public, they they start their life in a sense. They they start their own migration, and there there will be different uh, events, initiatives in which the work will be presented. Also in um, in, in many different contexts, activists, uh, academic, cultural, uh, as well. Um, for example, this uh, this summer, uh, we'll be showing some of our investigations in uh, Zurich uh, in an, an event, cultural event called uh, Theater Spectacle uh, in open air. And there will be different events that will be um, coming together as well uh, in, in the near future. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, we can, we can already say that uh, this report has started its life and to live. Uh, there have been articles in The Guardian, in The Zeit, uh, and in many other news outlets. But if there have been journalists right now listening, uh, please feel free to contact uh, Border Forensics, to contact Medico International, if you want to have uh, further information on that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think we, we just can hope that this report is used by many, many activists and civil society actors as a weapon. I like this term. So thank you very much to the whole team uh, of Border Forensics, to Rumur, to Jack, to Sam, to Stan, to Charles, but also to the, to the back office team, which is not visible right now. Um, uh, but without them, this wouldn't be possible. So thank you all of you. And Giovanna, yeah. Yelka, Kathy, I see uh, you all out there. Uh, thanks to all of you. Absolutely. Yes. And I mean, uh, there will be new research. There will be new reports coming out. But yeah, let's see what the future brings.
So um, uh, thank you very much for participating and I hope to see you next time. You can download the report on the website of Border Forensics. So have a nice evening and yeah, stay strong. <laughs>